Well, my name is Thaddeus. If uh, you missed it the first time, I'm uh, one of the pastors here, the lead pastor at 704, and um, I get the privilege of bringing the word again to you today. Uh, we are continuing in our Psalms of Ascent, and the interesting thing is that we only have three weeks left, and three weeks left meaning of the series, but also until Easter. And if you've been with us the whole time, yeah, a little hooty hoot on the, I just read John Wooden's kid's book to my kids, and it they blow a whistle, it goes hooty toot toot. And so that's what we just did there. Um, you go on to the next building block, a block of success. But we have three weeks until Easter and three more Psalms of Ascent. There's 15 of them, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And uh, the interesting thing is that as we go, we start to kind of see that they build on each other. And, and this week and the next week and the last week, you got to think that as they're journeying on their path, they're getting pretty close. And, and I want to make a shameless plug into that for us getting ready for Easter. Is that as we get ready, one of the goals of us as a church is that we want to not be surprised that Easter, Resurrection Sunday, what we believe as Christians, the single most significant event in human history, that we're going to celebrate not just the death of a Messiah, but the resurrection of the promised Messiah the suffering servant, the king of David, the one who Revelation says twice will be king over every single king and lord over every single lord for eternity. Today and for eternity. And so as we get closer, I just want to continue to challenge you. We, we've done stuff as a church to invite people to be a part of church on Easter Sunday. More people will attend Easter Sunday in the United States than any other Sunday of the year. Mother's Day and Christmas Day are the other two close to it. And maybe there's people in your life that you would say, man, I, I know that they would benefit from being a part of a worshiping community. And I like to think we have a pretty good one. And so if there's people in your community, people in your work, just I, we've started to pray for them. And I wonder if you would just even invite them now. They say when you should invite people to Easter is like four weeks ahead of time because people make plans. Except some of you are like, I don't use a calendar. And I'm like, how do you live? <laughs> Maybe you don't have kids, or I don't know what it is, but um, three and a half weeks, and we'll be at Easter. We have two more Sundays after this, and then Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection together. It's going to be an amazing time. Um, but we are continuing this series, and uh, the, we're going to be in Psalm uh, 132 today. And the question I want to ask you as you turn there is to consider uh, in your life, what is the most um, I'm trying to figure out a way to word this, the most heartfelt promise you've ever made. You don't have to talk back to me right now because I want you to turn there. Psalm 132. What's the, the biggest, uh, you could maybe, I was thinking about like a mortgage for a house. That's a pretty big promise. You're going to pay it back with interest. Maybe for some of you, it was on your wedding day. You said the traditional vows that I'm going to be a loving and faithful husband or wife, right? In plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and health, as long as we both shall live. That's a huge promise. Maybe it was the moment that you had children and you made a prompt. Maybe you didn't articulate anything, but you said maybe to yourself, I'm going to be the best parent. I'm going to do everything I can to provide and protect, to love and also to care and be the parent this child needs. I don't know what it is, but uh, maybe it was even a bad thing. You really wanted a different job and you made a promise to yourself or maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're not. It's promised to some higher power. If I get this thing, I'm going to live my life differently. We've made those vows before, have we not? This is a beautiful psalm. It's actually the longest, one of the longest of the Psalms of Ascent, 17 or 18 verses. The last week was three, and next week is three, and the week after that is three. And I think the beautiful thing that I saw is that it has two promises, two oaths that we're going to see. One of them is David's, and one of them is God's. And we haven't done this for a while, but a spoonful of Old Testament context helps the ancient teaching go down. And what David is going to be mentioned about, Solomon, we believe, is writing this psalm, is something called the Ark of the Covenant. And if you think Indiana Jones, you're not wrong, but it's not really the same one. Um, but so the Ark of the Covenant is something that would be helpful for us to have a picture of in our minds. And so keep your finger in Psalm 132 and then open to Exodus chapter 25. Look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. 
This is when the ark is being described of what, how it's going to be built. This is Moses in the Exodus, and God's saying you're going to make something called an ark. Verse 8, chapter 25, verse 8, and I almost didn't put the verses up on the screen because I wanted you to find it on your own, but I'm just really generous today. So, yeah, take them down from the screen. Um, So Exodus 25, verse 8, read this with me, just follow along. It says, then let them, as God speaking through Moses, make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And then verse 10, they're not going to have this in there. It says, let them make an ark. And it just means a chest. And he's going to go on to describe all the things on this ark or this chest. It was about... uh, three and a half by two feet tall. So think of a, maybe something as big as this. And, and in that chest, in that ark would be housed the 10 commandments of Moses. And later on, actually a jar of manna. And after, uh, the 10 commandments as well, uh, Aaron's rod, which proved that people should listen to Aaron. And what he's going to say in Exodus 25 is he's going to describe how it's going to be made, but then what is going to happen, because you might have always wondered, what's the really significant thing about the ark? Other than the Ten Commandments, we know those are important. Verse 22 of Exodus 25 says this, and you can underline 8 and 9 and then also 22. They're good verses to know. There, above the cover, there's going to be a cover. The two cherubim, these are angels that are facing each other that are over the ark of the covenant law. I, God, will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. And so he's speaking to the high priest, whoever that's going to be. God is going to meet with the high priest and give the high priest all the law for all the people. So in their minds and in reality, the ark, this chest, and then the covering over it with the angels that were facing each other and then the blood that was sprinkled over it on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, this was the place where God's presence was. He, he showed up in other spots. We know that. But if you got near that thing, you knew that you were either in trouble or going to get blessed. And so we see this journey of the Ark of the Covenant. And, and actually at the end of Exodus, flip over a couple pages, you stay there. We got like seven verses in the Old Testament we're going to look at. Should be like 50 if I had my way. Exodus 40 verse 34 It's talking about them wandering through the wilderness, and it says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We're going to say Moses couldn't even go in. And so what's happening is that they have this mobile temple sanctuary. The ark is in the middle. In Exodus 34, the cloud comes in, and it is like God's presence is there. We know it is. And what happens after? We've talked about this before, is that the cloud would rise, and everybody break down tent, over a million men, (laughs) lots of people, And they'd follow this cloud sometimes for a day, and then the cloud would settle. And they'd set everything back up with this chest, this ark, in the dead center of it. Because that's the hot spot of God's presence. And that's a whole other sermon of sometimes it was a day, and sometimes a month, and sometimes a year. And you're like, that would be a terrible way. If we were like, hey, cut service, we're going to actually go over here real quick. And you're like, no, but we're comfortable. (laughs) All right, that's enough of that sermon. But so then the journey continues. We see that the ark throughout the Old Testament ends up at a place called Shiloh. It's a place to worship. You can just note if you like to take notes. This is in Joshua chapter 18. And then we see that it actually moves to a place called Bethel, which is in Judges chapter 20. And the word Bethel just means house of the Lord. Bait is the word for house and El is the word for God. So Bethel means house of God. We then see and turn over with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4. And you might have a subheading. Does anybody have a subheading at the beginning of, or right before, like in the middle, actually, of verse 1? What does it say? The Philistines do what? They capture the ark. So this is a fascinating story that's good to read because the people of God are like going to war back and forth with the Philistines, praying and saying, should we go? And God's like, yes. And then like, should we go? And he's like, no. And they're like, we don't really know. They're winning. They're losing. When battle goes poorly, they're like, let's bring the ark. Because if that's there, we're going to win. And they start to use it (laughs) as a tool. And they get out there and the Philistines go, the ark's there. We've heard about that thing. And then they're terrified. But then they go, if we could get our hands on it, 
It could do something really good. And so the Philistines, this is, you know, David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. They get control of the ark of God. They have it in their possession, but it doesn't go well for them. (laughs) What happens? Maybe you know the story. Maybe you've never read this. This is where reading the Old Testament can be laborious if you're in like Leviticus. (laughs) And there's laws or numbers, which is literally named numbers because it has a lot of numbers in it, right? That's a series we're doing soon, actually. It's going to be good. Um, But what happened, (laughs) if you just moaned, all right, so (laughs) maybe we'll revisit it. We're not. We're doing it. Um, So what happens is the ark gets taken by the Philistines, but then look over in 1 Samuel chapter 5. What happens when the Philistines, verse 2, take the ark? It says, then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. Hold on. So this is another God, another deity. This is fantastic, too, right? What happens here? It says, when the people of Ashdod, that's where the ark is, in the temple of Dagon, rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground, which if you read the Bible often, that is a posture of worship. Before the ark of the Lord, they took Dagon and put him back in his place. Verse 4. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That's why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others entered Dagon's temple at Ashdod's step on the threshold. Threshold. It says the Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. So then they say, hey, we don't, want to, we don't want this anymore. Clearly, it's not a good thing. We've got tumors. Our Dagon's fallen over and over and over. It's breaking stuff. So they move it to a place called Gath, and then they move it to a place called Ekron. And they go, we actually don't want it anywhere around us. We should send it back. They settle it up. They put it on this cattle, this cow, a couple of them, and they go, let's see which way it goes. If it goes right back to God's people, we'll know that it shouldn't be theirs. And they go, and we also should put a sacrifice on it. And so they get, this is where I don't fully understand this, they take five gold tumors, because God gave them tumors, and five gold rats, and they put it on this little cart with the cows pulling the ark. And the cows go straight to a place called kiriath Jerim, and that name is going to come up in this psalm, so this is important. The cows go all the way back to kiriath Jerim, and if you want to follow it, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is when we hear about Uzzah. And the cattle stumbles and he tries to, we often think he liked to help keep the ark upright, but the word in Hebrew is that he grasped it to take advantage of it. And God smites Uzzah, who is an Israelite, for touching the ark of the covenant. David hears about this and he goes, that's terrifying. I don't want it anywhere near me because I might slip and fall and touch it. And so he leaves it in a place called Obed-Edom. But Obed-Edom is a faithful Israelite, stays there for 20 years, and he's like, boy, life's been great. (laughs) Like, I'm reaping a hundredfold. All my kids are having kids. Like, we don't have enough room for all my kids. You know, like all the ways that you would measure success in an ancient world, he had it. And David's like, well, maybe we should bring it back. So David brings it back. He goes to what is our psalm is going to call the fields of Jar, which is kiriath Jerim. He brings the ark back into the city of David, which is called Jerusalem. And then what happens when he brings it back in? He dances. He throws a party. Everybody's getting bread and raisin cakes and date cakes, which were delicious. If you didn't know what a raisin cake and a date cake would be, he throws a massive celebration. One of the translations says that every six steps the oxen took, he would make a sacrifice the whole way through. And this is really helpful. I believe it is, and you better believe it is, because I think it is. Um, Because the people that are singing this song are walking perhaps the same road that the ark took when it came back into Jerusalem. And that's where they're going to worship, at the ark, at the central place of God's holy presence. Right? It's neat. So let's read verse 1 of Psalm 132. If you don't understand anything of I just said, and you're a music fan, and you love famous musicians, imagine getting to walk on Abbey Road. (laughs) 
you're a fan of history and you don't understand anything that I just said, imagine I got to go one time to a Colosseum in Rome. You get to see what it would be, like there were still ruins of it. Maybe it would be uh, like I heard one of our friends, their parents are getting to finally visit the Holy Land to see the place Jesus walked and Paul ministered and all that stuff. Being in the place that it took place, this is what's happening. Psalm 132, it is 18 verses. Lord, remember David in all his self-denial. He swore an oath to the Lord. Here's his oath. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. And I want to point out the mighty one of Jacob occurs five times in the Old Testament, twice in this psalm. And what happened with Jacob is, remember, he uh, fell asleep and laid his head on a rock and he saw a stairway to heaven. And then he woke up and he's like, this rock must be fantastic. And so he turned the rock into a place of worship, which became called Bethel, and made that the place where God's presence was. So this rock was the center of God's worship, and he's calling this mighty God of Jacob because David also focuses on a place of worship, a thing to worship God in or at. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. Notice in verse 3 and 4, David is going to say the same thing four different ways. I don't want to sleep until it's done. And now he's going to say it like this. I will not enter my house. I will not go to my bed. I will not allow any sleep to my eyes. I will not allow slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling, here it is again, for the mighty one of Jacob. This is Solomon writing about David bringing this ark back and how he went through lots of work and endured lots of trials. We heard it, verse 6, in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jar. If you have a footnote, it will say Kiriath Jerim. That's where they brought it back from. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. Anointed one is a word that means Messiah. And we know that here it's referring to Solomon because he was an anointed one. But in the Old Testament, there's ways that prophecies are fulfilled immediately, but also will be fulfilled completely in the future. Verse 11. We just looked at David's oath. Now we get to see another person's oath. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I'll place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons shall sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation. Her faithful people shall ever sing for joy. Here I'll make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head shall be adorned with a radiant crown. It's interesting to think about what David's oath was versus what God's oath is. And to think about different oaths that people have made. And maybe you've thought about your own, but maybe there were people in your life. There was a pastor who led you to faith. Because he or she had made an oath to follow Jesus and do the work of a pastor. We think even more broadly, I think about Martin Luther, who had an oath to God to seek him at cost of his own life and reputation. And we can thank a person like Martin Luther for putting into words what is true biblically, that faith is by grace alone, not through works. It's written in there, but we didn't see it. Or other people later on in world history, like I think of William Wilberforce, he came to mind. And he was involved in the British government and helped to eliminate the triangular slave trade that was happening over the Atlantic. This is an amazing piece. Or maybe even Eugene Peterson, he's one of my favorites and he's just passed away a handful of years ago. Made an oath to follow Jesus and be a faithful pastor. His church never reached what we would call a megachurch prominence, four to six hundred people, but he faithfully translated the entire Bible into 
layman's tongue. We just read it for our offering. I wonder what other people uh, you think about have made oaths in your life. And maybe you've made them. You've thought about that. Maybe you've made oaths to your parents. I will be home at 11 (laughs) p.m. Maybe you've made them on your wedding day. Maybe uh, some of you have dedicated your kids to the Lord in our church. You've made an oath before God. Maybe you've made an oath of revenge. I'll never let that go. I'll get even. Maybe you made an oath for Lent. (laughs) I promise that I'm going to do this, God. The interesting thing I found in these two sets of oaths, and I know that we're running out of time. There's a lot of context, and I've got a little bit more is there's a really, really beautiful comparison between the oath that David makes and I believe our oaths in the same vein and the oath that God makes. And I've got four words that don't spell anything, so don't get upset. I was reading a book on preaching and the comment is Alec Motier is his name. And he said, Acronyms are helpful, but don't change your sermon to fit an acronym. And I go, amen, Alec Miotier. So I'm not doing it anymore. Um, (laughs) He says, if it works, it works. Um, So what I've done, uh, four things. I know some of you love to take notes, and the rest of you that don't, you should. Passion, blessing, necessity, and certainty. If you need help, (laughs) Patriots, Bills, Niners, Chiefs. You're welcome. (laughs) Passion. Blessing, necessity, and certainty. That kind of defines those teams too, right? Passion, Patriots, Blessing, Bills, Necessity, Niners, Chiefs, Certainty. No? Okay. So those are the four we're going to look at and compare David's vow to God's vow. The first one I want to look at is the P, the passion. Look at the passion of David. Look at verse 3 and 4. What is he saying about how passionate he is? Somebody talk to me. What's he vowing to do? Like, I'm not going to go to sleep. And, and commentators are all mixed up. They're like, was he literally not going to sleep because building this, bringing this thing back is going to take a long time? Or was he using metaphor? And probably he was using metaphor. But as I was praying about it, I wonder if you know about something that you're so excited about it that you can't sleep. And then there's also things that you're not so excited about that cause you that you can't sleep. And then there's some things that you really have to do so you won't sleep, but can't sleep and won't sleep are two very different things, right? So David's saying, I'm not going to sleep. Maybe he's saying, I can't sleep. I'm so pumped to be able to bring. We heard about that ark. We're going to bring it back. We've heard that there's blessing with it. Maybe he doesn't want to because he needs to make sure he gets it done quickly for the sake of himself and his people and to worship God. And for you, whatever the oaths are that you might end up making, think about the passion behind it. And you have this passion where you're giving of yourself. Maybe you don't say, I'm not going to go to sleep, but you say, I'm going to give money. I give, you know, you say 10%, I give 20% and I don't give it just to the church. I give it to all these nonprofits. I have money in my wallet all the time in case anybody asks me because I want to be a generous person. Give of your time. There were so many people. I love it. Last month, we had 83 people that served at least one time in this church. That's crazy. There's just over 100 that attend. So you go, I give passionately of my time. That's what I'm sacrificing. And we also have talked about talents, that there's an ability that I have. I'm going to contribute this because I know how to do it. So he has a passion. I ain't going to sleep. And then the second one is a blessing, the B or the bills, if you're following along. What is the blessing of his oath? Look at verse 5. He says, till I find a place for the Lord. And what is he going to bless God with? A home. A dwelling is what the NIV says. A home is the same word. There's also going to be a blessing not just for God. So David's like, I'm committed to bring the ark back. I'm going to give you a home, God. But also look at verse 8 and 9 because there's a blessing for other people. Verse 9 says, your priest will be clothed with what? Righteousness. And remember, righteousness is a status 
It's not uh, an agreement. It means that you are right relationally with someone. You're, and clothing means you're going to wear it. You're going to feel the right status. And what does he say at the end of verse 9? Your faithful people are going to do what? Sing for joy. That's a good blessing. So there's passion. I'm not going to sleep. There's going to be blessing for you, God, and for me, and for our people. I'm getting pumped. And then he says there's a necessity. And this is the great question I have. Does God need it? I have in my hand a pretty neat thing. Um, This is from, uh, if anybody knows this, the uh, Penguin Patch Holiday Shop. Anybody familiar? It's a very lucrative place. Uh, Only the best in Indian Trail Elementary get to frequent its halls. And every year my kids buy me. They're not in here, are they? Good. (laughs) Don't watch this message. Um, This is a cool toy. It's not a toy. It's a tool. And I can make it a Phillips head screwdriver, and I can take this thing out. If you can't see it, I've got another Phillips head that isn't actually any different in size. And then I've got a flat head that I can put on there in case I need something else, because sometimes you need a flat head or a Phillips head. If you don't know what a Phillips head, it's the one with four on it. And a flat head's the one that's just flat. My son got me this gift for Christmas at the <laughs> Penguin Patch Shop, which is such a funny name for it. And my question for you is, do I need this? It's a good mom over there. You do need that. You hold on to that. Yes and no, right? Do I need a flathead and a Phillips head in my pocket or in my car that can be interchangeable? Not really. I probably got one somewhere. But this one also says something on it. It says super dad. Yeah, legit, right? And the funny thing is that Rosie and Jackson got me the same thing. They both got me. I'm a super, super dad. Uh, But do I want it? You You can't take this one. I don't need it. But man, I want it. Why do I want it? Because I got to see my kids when they were doing chores to say, I need to get some money for the penguin patch shop. And I'm like, what is a penguin patch shop? You know, I get to buy Christmas gifts. And I'm like, awesome. What do you want? And I go, you know, whatever you get me is going to be. No, tell me. And they're like, you like tools, don't you? I'm like, sure. And then I get to see them when they come home and they're like, don't look in my backpack. I got something, but I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> Not until Christmas. And then I see them trying to wrap it. And then I get to deal with them being like, do you want me to tell you what it is? Because I won't. Do you want me to tell you? Because I'm not going to. I'm going to tell Rosie, and she's going to tell you. And like all this stuff, right? And then what happens on Christmas Day? They're like, open mine first. You know, I'm like, no, I want to open what Kristen got me. That's usually, you know, but I'm like, okay, I'll open yours. You know, and I open, I'm like, this is so cool. You know, I overreact and I'm like, this is amazing. So do I need this? Heck no, but do I want it more than anything else? The beauty in David's oath is that God didn't need A temple. You can read it on your own. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time, but 2 Samuel 7, David's like, I need to build a temple. And God speaks to the prophet Nathan. And he goes, tell David, I don't need a temple. And he says these things like, I've been leading you and working around your life and moving in and through you for years. And I've never needed a permanent place Do you think that I can be contained in a house of cedar? Even that box that you call the ark, that doesn't contain me. That symbolizes me. And Nathan tells David, and by the way, you're not going to get to build it. Your son's going to get to build it. And David's like, I don't care. I want to do it so bad. And God says, okay. Did God need it? But did God see the passion that David had? The planning, the maybe saving his money to go to the penguin patch shop. They didn't call it that back then. That when he gets to, from heaven, see Solomon dedicate the temple in the prayer, he is like, look, God, at what he's doing. That's what I was helping do. And God's like, I know, man. (laughs) You know, it works. You know, like, I don't know what he says. But isn't that the beautiful picture is that you think about, we have the passion. David's like, oh, we're going to crush it. And then the blessing is it's, God, I'm going to have you a house. It's going to be a box that you can live in. God's like, I don't need it, but man, I want it. 
the certainty, the chiefs. <laughs> is David's oath guaranteed or is it just hopeful? Because all the uh, plans that David has is dependent on his resources. Uh, the, not just the resources, being able to get them, but then creativity and design and then ability and craftsmanship. You need like three at least different people to do that. And not just that, but also getting enough manual labor. And then by getting that, you have to either inspire it or demand it. So figuring out how to do that. And then you probably need someone to organize, like organize that. So you need an organizational leadership guru, right? So can David promise that he's going to do his oath not really. At the end of the day, ultimately, God gives breath and life and owns all of the resources. And so it's really, if we're doing anything, it's because of him. And so when you look at those four things, the passion of David is great. Maybe your passion is great. The blessing of his oath is great. And you might think the blessing of what my commitment is going to bring is great. Does God need it? And then we look at the certainty can we promise anything? This is the beautiful thing when you compare this to God's oath that comes up later in the chapter. And I'll give you a spoiler alert. <laughs> One of them is better than the other. Look at the passion of God. We see this, verse 11. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. You guys have your Bibles out. You need to open with me to the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 2. The passion of God in his oath to David and Solomon and all of God's people is fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. David's passion about not sleeping versus God's passion about enduring the cross. The next line says, scorning its shame. Jesus bore your shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you don't grow weary and lose heart. There's another beautiful New Testament passage that if you've never underlined, friends, underline. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Describing Jesus being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The word in your Bibles might be grasped, which actually harkens back to when Uzzah grasped the cart. Rather, he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I've used to say it's a toy maker becoming a toy, but I've found when you talk to kids, it works better to say a pet owner becoming a pet, <laughs> to let them know how much you're there for them, to communicate fully your love for them, becoming your animal. And he, being found in appearance as a man, he then humbled himself even further, not just a pet owner becoming a pet, but becoming obedient to death, and then even further, death on a cross, which was cursed. His passion compared to David's passion, compared to our passion. The beautiful thing is that when we compare ours and David's and Solomon's and everybody else in the Bible to God's, we all basically end up on the same level. Because it's not able to be compared. The passion God has for you that the psalmist is saying, hey, we're almost to Jerusalem. We can see the city. You can smell it. Realize how his oath to you is that there's going to be a family and I'm going to have at least one son. And we know that when he talks about the anointed one, he's talking about Jesus. There's a passion, but there's also a blessing. We think that David's blessing is it. God, I'm going to build you a box. When I say it that way, I know you're like, that doesn't sound like a great thing. It was a great thing. What it ended up being was Solomon's temple, which was one of the most magnificent worship facilities in the entire known world. But what is the blessing that comes with God's oath? Look at verse 15 and 16 of chapter 132. I'll bless her with abundant provisions. 
Her poor I'll satisfy with food. I'll clothe her priests, not with righteousness alone, not a good relationship, but salvation, saving and rescuing and redeeming and restoring. Her faithful people, and I love that the psalmist did this. I didn't notice this until I read a commentary. So if you didn't notice it, nothing on you. Verse 9, read the second line of verse 9. It says, may your faithful people do what? Sing for joy. What does verse 16 say? Her faithful people shall what? Ever sing for joy. He, he emphasizes the verb sing in the Hebrew. Say so it's going to be like singing and singing and singing and singing. This is what we're going to be able to do because of God's oath. You don't like singing. It's because you don't think you're good at it. When you're singing out of joy because God's returned, you're going to be loving it. <laughs> If you don't believe the blessing of God, you can think about Ephesians 3. It says that God is able to do immeasurably more than all that you can ask or think. And then I love this line. It says, according to his power, because oftentimes we have ideas and dreams about what we could do and how we could bless other people or God. And that's according to our imagination and our power. And it says it's beyond our imagination and not according to ours. Thank God, but it is according to his power that is at work within us. Another verse is if Isaiah 55. They're going to put it up on the screen. Satisfied with food? Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters and you have no money. Come, buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. The beautiful thing about the passion is that our passion may be intense, but it can't be sustained. God's passion is infinite and it is permanent. The beautiful thing in this psalm that I saw is that the, the blessing of our oath is limited. The blessing of God's oath is immeasurable. The necessity of the oath, do we need it? A, a second question is, do we want it? And I can't answer that. I want it. I don't know if you do. But do we need it? I can answer that. John 15, verse 5. If you're still turning with me, let's go. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do a little bit. You can do something. Now, Jesus' words here are very clear. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. If you don't remain in me, it's not just you can't do nothing. You're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Those branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. The, the interesting thing about oaths and the necessity of them, and we use my super dad tool. And I know I have two of them. That still doesn't mean you can have one of them. Is that God uh, is pleased by our oaths, isn't he? I think he doesn't need them, but we are fulfilled by his. Our life would be nothing. We would have no fruit, do nothing, be useful for fuel for a fire. If apart from his oath, to be with us and to forgive us. And the last thing is a certainty. <laughs> we seldom keep our oaths, don't we? far too seldom. Friends, God cannot revoke his. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. So he's talking about where the ark would have been held. Saying Jesus goes into that inner sanctuary for us. He becomes our forerunner, Jesus. He's entered on our behalf. He's become our high priest forever. I, I, I wish that I could keep my oaths more, but friends, the beauty of following God is that even when I fail my oaths, I know that he can't break his. If he said it, he's going to do it. If he's promised it, it's going to happen. 
And oftentimes when we're looking at the promises of God, it's hard because they're not happening in our time. There's a lot of great cliches about it. He says yes or no or wait or whatever. He's, he says all these things to our answers, but we have to see not in our momentary struggle of how hard life is, but to look back on the history of God's people and even the history of your own life. Think of it for a moment. The way that God's actually gotten you out of bed this morning. You have breath. We have a good friend who just lost a best friend. Young, my age, married with kids. And I wake up this morning. I go, I'm tired, you know? And then I can pause and I go, thank you, God, for the breath in my lungs for another day. You've promised it. What we're going to do as a response is we're going to take communion. Because I think it's a fitting look at the oath God made. Right? It's funny when, whenever we do communion, I'm like, oh, it ties in really well. I wonder if there's any part of the Bible that it doesn't tie in well with. But if you want to know the connection in Psalm 132, and they're going to have the communion elements. I think most of you took one when you came in. I have one in my jacket. I'm going to walk over here, though, because you threw things at me last time. <laughs> I got one here. The phrase in Psalm 132 is anointed one. It means Messiah. And I like, I want to point your attention to uh, verse 10. It says, do not reject your anointed one. You know that Isaiah 53 prophesies about the Messiah, the suffering servant. And you know, the word that it uses is rejected. But friends, uh, in three weeks, we know that Jesus didn't stay rejected, did he? And he wasn't rejected because of anything he did. That prophecy goes on to say that he was striped for your iniquities. He suffered on your behalf. That when we take this bread and this juice, if you don't know why, it's because the last meal Jesus had with his best friends before he went to die for them and for you was this. This is what they shared. And when the psalmist sings, for the sake of your servant David, don't reject your anointed one. Friends, we don't sing for the sake of your servant David. We sing, God, for the sake of your servant Jesus, the Messiah, the one anointed one, the Savior of the world, don't reject us. And God says, I can't. <laughs> if you've received him, you are covered in the same way that that ark would be covered by blood, which would symbolically cover the Ten Commandments because everybody had broken it. We are covered by the blood of Jesus, covering all of the things that we've done, even today, that would separate us from a holy and perfect God. And in three weeks, we know that he was rejected but didn't stay rejected. Matthew's gospel and... Others recount when they go to the tomb, they find it empty. They say the great phrase. We're going to say it in a few weeks, but I want to go ahead and say it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You say that with me, church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. So Jesus... Uh, commands his disciples, he says, um, do this in remembrance of me. So uh, for the next few minutes, the band's going to lead in worship. I, I, if you've already eaten it, that's fine, but hold on to it. And I want you to remember uh, this. He says, it's my body. And he says, this is my blood. He says, body broken and crushed as blood poured out. I want you to consider the passion that you have for God. Maybe it's not quite what David's oath was, maybe, and these came up a little bit this morning, so they might be specifically for someone. Maybe when you think about your passion, you go, well, I bring enough. I don't bring as much as that person, but what can you expect? I'm here. I serve. I give. I don't know whatever. I, I don't have that specific. I just know that there's an idea like, I, I bring enough. You should be happy with that. 
Another one is that uh, maybe your passion leads you to think that God better be glad you're here. (laughs) He must be glad I'm on his team because if I wasn't, what would he do? Maybe when you think about your passion for the next few minutes, you think, I don't have anything to put passion to. I don't have money. I don't have any time. I don't have any talents that could actually help. And the verse that came up over and over again, um, the phrase is Jesus calls us higher on eye level is when he interacts with Peter. He says, Peter, uh, take care of my sheep. He goes, okay. And he goes, do you love me? And Peter responds with a different Greek word. We've talked about this. Jesus says, do you unconditionally and at cost to yourself love me? Peter says, I love you like a brother. And Jesus is like, all right, do you love me? Unconditionally at cost to yourself love me. And Peter says, I love you like a brother. And what does Jesus do the third time? He changes his word. He says, do you love me like a brother? And Peter's like, knuckles, you know? So maybe you're here and you go, I bring enough. And Jesus is like, you bring enough. But there's more. Maybe you think about your sacrifice and you would say, God better be glad I'm here. And he goes, I'm glad you're here. I don't know what tone you need to hear that in, but I know you need to hear it. I am glad you're here. Maybe you think there's nothing that I can bring. And he would say, there's nothing that you can bring that I need. And then he would speak to you and he says, I just want you. He just wants a relationship with you to cost immeasurable to himself, to give you life unlimited in him. We take this together, church. We're going to sing... The thing I love about it is that grace fuels worship, doesn't it? We sang it earlier, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Grace received leads to worship lived. If I can broaden that out, only in us understanding the passionate grace we've received can live a life full of passionate worship. It's funny because I typed that up before Pat ever said the thing he said at the very beginning. That our worship isn't going to be just for this 90 minutes, just while we're singing the songs, it's going out. But friends, hopefully this morning, you've seen a picture of Psalm 132 of the oath that God made that he can't break. That's grace to you. How many ever times you break your oath, he doesn't break his. And you now are freed, you're moved, you're motivated, you're encouraged into a life of worship out of that. Could we stand together and worship him as one? Let's stand.